את uh, יקיר לוין. You want to talk from here, from there? From there. Okay. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, יקיר. I, uh, my acquaintance with יקיר goes very many years back. I've been following his uh, career. He left us uh, for Be'er Sheva. Um, he is uh, he's now teaching at Be'er Sheva. Uh, the beginning was interested in... Uh, at the beginning was interested in uh, obscure questions or like uh, transcendental arguments, but now, uh, if I understand correctly, he's more uh, interested in uh, what is called the early modern philosophy. Um, he's written uh, a few things about this. Uh, and his last uh, book, is uh, 14 metaphysical uh, etudes, this is right? Yeah. yeah? Uh, okay, uh, so um, his subject today is uh, Descartes against the scholastics, who has the upper hand? Okay, please. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? The scholastic neo-Aristotelian notion of substance is a complicated and highly nuanced notion which has many specific versions. In his sharp criticism of this notion, however, Descartes does not get into the fine details, nor does he relate to its different versions. As he writes to Mersenne, Why doesn't it work? Okay, as he writes to Mersenne, I do not think that the diversity of the opinions of the, scholati, of the scholastics makes the philosophy difficult to refute. It is easy to overturn the foundations on which they all agree, and once that has been done, all the disagreements over detail will seem foolish. Indeed, at the core of his rejection of the scholastic notion lies his deep dissatisfaction with a specific explanatory framework which goes hand in hand with all versions uh, of this notion. According to this explanatory framework, as the Quambrian fathers put it, each and every natural thing must have an inherent and primitive feature, substantial form, from which it is formed, by which degrees of eminence and perfection in physical compositions are determined, on which all propagation of things depends, in which the marks and character of each thing are stamped, from which its individual and particular behaviors arise, and finally, which distinguishes and adorns the remarkable theater of this world with its variety and wonderful beauty. Determining the essential properties of natural things, the range of accidental properties they can have, and their characteristic behavior, substantial forms explain why things are as they are and why they behave as they do. However, being primitive, the substantial forms do not provide an explanation of how they yield the features and behaviors of natural things. Indeed, leaving the manner of functioning of substantial forms as a brute fact, the scholastic explanatory framework is teleological insofar as it refers to inclination to ends which substantial forms ground. In the words of Aquinas, an inclination to an end follows from the form because everything, insofar as, as it is in actuality, acts and aims at that which is appropriate for, its, for it in accordance with its form. Another quotation, every form has some inclination that follows from it. 
Fire, for example, is inclined by its form toward a higher place and toward generating that which is like it. Therefore, a natural inclination, which is called natural appetite, follows from this natural form. An agent moves only from the intention for an end. For if an agent were not determined to some effect, it would no more do one thing than another. So for it to produce a determinate effect, it is necessary that it be determined to something certain, which has the character of an end. Descartes' main objection to the scholastic explanatory framework relates to the primitiveness of the substantial forms, due to which they explain, as he says, that which is obscure through that which is more obscure. But declaring in this way the unknown by what is unknown, to use Boyle's similar formulation, is to tell nothing, as Newton put it, or not to explain anything in Descartes' own phrasing. For referring once again to Boyle, to explicate the phenomenon, it is not enough to ascribe to it, it to ascribe it to one general efficient cause, but we must intelligibly show the particular manner how that general cause produces the, the uh, proposed effect. We must, in Leibniz's words, take the trouble to examine its manner of operation. Otherwise, it would be as if we were content to say that the clock has the quality of clockness derived from its substantial form without considering in what all this consists. That would be sufficient for the person who buys the clock, provided that it turns over its skirt to another. For this very reason, Descartes makes clear in his exchange with Franz Buhmann, uh, that, uh, as, as Descartes makes clear in his exchange with uh, Franz Buhmann, the teleological aspect of scholastic explanation is explanatorily vacuous. This rule, that we must never argue from ends, should be carefully heeded, for the knowledge of a thing's purpose never leads us to knowledge of the thing itself. Its nature remains just as obscure to us. Indeed, this constant practice of arguing from ends is Aristotle's greatest fault. A genuine explanation must be in terms of how the explanants brings about the explanandum, merely referring to inclinations to, of objects to behave in one way or another, as the scholastics do, is nothing but to redescribe the behavior to be explained, which is the gist of Moliere's famous ridicule of the foolish doctor in Le Malade Imaginaire. To say that opium produces sleep because of its dormitive power, or its inclination to produce sleep when taken is nothing more than to say that it causes sleep when taken. As Hobbes poignantly put it, scholastics said that bodies descended because they were heavy. But if you ask what they mean by heaviness, they will define it to be an endeavor to go to the center of the earth. So that the cause why things sink downward is an endeavor to be below, which is as much as to say that bodies descend or ascend because they do. The scholastic philosophers, in Malbranche's a slightly different way of making the same point, have trouble understanding that they are no more learned than before just because they are learned to say that fire dissolves metal because it has a dissolving faculty, and that man does not, does not digest because he has a weak stomach or because his digestive faculty is not performing its functions well. In contrast, Descartes' identification of the most fundamental feature of material, material substances with extension is supposed to enable a non-vacuous explanations of material phenomena in terms of the mechanisms that yield them, as he clearly put it in the principles. First of all, I considered in general all the clear and distinct notions which our understanding can contain uh, with regard to material things. And I found no other except for the notions we have of shapes, sizes, and motions, and the rules in accordance with which these three things can be modified by each other, 
with rules which are the principles of geometry and mechanics. And I judged as a, as a result that all the knowledge which men have of the natural world must necessarily be derived from these notions. Next, I considered in general terms, firstly, what are the principal differences which can exist between the sizes, shapes, positions of bodies, which are imperceptible by the senses merely because of the small size, and secondly, what observable effects would result from their various interactions. Later on, when I observed, when I observed just such effects in object that can be perceived by the senses, <coughs> I judged that they in fact arouse uh, from just uh, such an interaction of bodies that cannot be perceived, especially since it seemed impossible to think up any other explanations for them. In this matter, I was greatly helped by considering artifacts. For I do not recognize any difference between artifacts and natural bodies, except that the operations of artifacts are for the most part performed by mechanisms which are large enough to be easily <coughs> perceivable by the senses, as indeed must be the case if they are to be capable of being manufactured by human beings. The effects produced by, in nature, by contrast, almost always depend on structures which are so minute that they completely elude our senses. Moreover, mechanics is a division, is a, a division or special case of physics. And all the explanations belonging to the former also belong to the latter. So it is no less natural for a clock constructed with this or that set of wheels to tell the time it is for a tree which grew from this or that seed to produce the appropriate food. Men who are experienced in dealing with machinery can take a particular machine whose function they know and by looking at some of its parts easily form a conjecture about the design of the other parts which they cannot see. In the same way, I have attempted to consider the observable effects and parts of natural bodies and track down the imperceptible causes and particles <coughs> which produce them. And this very same mechanistic perspective, Descartes applied not just to inanimate objects, but also to living organisms, including humans. I suppose the body to be nothing but a statue or machine made of earth, which God forms with the explicit intention of making it as much as possible like us. Thus God not only gives it externally the colors and shapes of all the parts of our bodies, but also places inside it all the parts required to make it walk, eat, breathe, and indeed to imitate all those of our functions which can be imagined to, uh, to proceed from matter and to depend solely on the disposition of our organs. We see clocks, artificial fountains, mills, and other such machines which, although only man-made, have the power to move of their own accord in many different ways. But I'm supposing this machine to be made by the hands of God, and so I think you may reasonably think it capable of greater variety of movements than I could possibly ascribe to it. The card then considered descriptions of the behavior of material system, which do not refer to the mechanisms responsible for this behavior, is explan explanatorily vacuous. However, such descriptions need not be explanatorily vacuous, provided that they refer to covering laws which enable to describe the state of the systems of the system at any given point in time, given its state at, at an earlier time. Unlike mutual organizations, covering laws are counterfactually supported. <coughs> that is, the consequences are dependent on the antecedents so that changes in the latter are reflected in changes in the former. Thus, a generalization such as uh, that when the factory horns are sounded in Bristol, the workers at the factories in Manchester stop working is not a covering law. Had the factory horns in Bristol been out of order and sounded at some other time than they usually do, the workers in Manchester would still stop working at the same time as usual. In contrast, 
the generalization that uh, any two bodies in the universe attract each other with a force that is directly proportional to the product of the masses, inversely, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, <coughs> Newton's law, law of uh, universal gravitation is a covering law. At the bodies at different masses, while the distances <coughs> between them remain the same, the force with which they attract each other would have been different. Being counterfactually supporting, covering laws have two closely related features. First, unlike mere generalizations, they reflect non-arbitrary fundamental aspects of the systems they characterize, and in that sense are genuine scientific laws. Second, they allow reasoning about as yet unobserved basic features of these systems. That is, what features they would have given different conditions, given dif what features they would have given different conditions, thereby being predictive of them. But these uh, two features of covering laws endow descriptions that are based on such laws with an explanatory dimension. Subsuming states of affairs under genuine laws, descriptions of this type can both predict the occurrence of these states of affairs and provide an answer to the question of why they have occurred. Prediction and explanation here being two sides of the same coin. In this, indeed, this dual aspect of covering laws is at the core of the positivist, uh, the positivist a deductive nomological model of explanation, virtually the received view of explanation in contemporary philosophy, according to which a phenomenon uh, is explained uh, by showing how a description of it can be derived from a set of covering laws and initial conditions. Thus, the position of mass, to take a, a classic example, at some future time, is, a, is explained on this model by way of deriving it from Newton's laws of motion, the Newtonian law of uh, universal gravitation, and information about the mass of the sun, the mass of Mars, and the present position and velocity of each. Okay. The clear tendency of scholastic thinkers, which became the dominant approach amongst late scholastics, was to view the substantial forms as real powers. However, focusing a la Descartes on the explanatory implications of the notion of substantial forms and deploying uh, the deductive nonological uh, descriptive model of explanation, the DN model as I call it, the dispute between Descartes and the scholastics can be reconstructed in a way that setting aside the metaphysical baggage of substantial forms can shed new interesting light on this dispute. Thus, Descartes takes the scholastic model of explanation to be vacuous since it is tantamount to a description of the phenomenon to be explained rather than to a mechanistic explanation of how this phenomena came about. If the descriptions assumed by the scholastic model are based on mere generalizations, or perhaps even on mere statement of specific features of the phenomena at issue at given times, Descartes would be correct in his criticism of the scholastic model. However, <laughs> his criticism is completely mistaken if the description assumed by the scholastic model are construed as of the DN type. The, the deductive nomological type. In that case, the dispute between him and the scholastics would be a dispute concerning two legitimate conceptions of explanations and may be viewed as turning on the question of which of these two conceptions, the mechanistic one, or rather the descriptive DN one, is to be deployed in explaining natural phenomena. Adapted to the developments in science since Descartes' times, this question boils down to the question of whether our world is such that all portions of it can be explained mechanistically, or rather at least some, of, some portions can be ex explained by the DN model only, only descriptively. So that's the plan of the rest, uh, my plan for the rest of the talk. 
Based on an outline of contemporary dispute in neurocognitive science, which reflects this question, I will devote the rest of the paper for arguing that contrary to Descartes' view and in line with the scholastic view, as I reconstructed it, there may well be features of the world that can only be explained by the DN model, that can only be explained descriptively. So that will be my main claim. Okay. Based on a careful analysis of actual work in neurocognitive science, for example, visual processing and memory, prominent philosophers of mind, ecum science, such as Carl Craver and William Bechtel, have been arguing for a new Cartesian mechanistic model of explanation in this field. As Bechtel defines it, a mechanism is a structure performing a function in virtue of its component parts, component operations, and the organization. The orchestrated functioning of the mechanism is responsible for one or more phenomena. Consisting of parts, qua structural components and operations, qua processes or changes involving the parts, mechanisms are decomposable both structurally and functionally. Indeed, mechanistic explanations consist of the compositions of the mechanisms of the mechanism into working parts or parts involved in the operations, assigning to these specific operations and showing how specific behavior of the mechanism emerge from the orchestrated operation of these parts. Usually, such a mechanistic decomposition can be performed for each working part of the mechanism and for uh, the part of any such part and so, on for, and, and so on and so forth, typically bottoming out in some lowest level mechanisms beneath which more detail is either superfluous or unavailable. So mechanistic explanations are inherently interleveled, where each level consists of the working parts of the level below it and their organization or operational interrelations. An explanation of this type forms a nested hierarchy of mechanisms within mechanisms. Yet, how detailed both inter- and intra-levels should such an explanation be depends on the expl exploratory, explanatory, and instrumental objectives motivating it. Due to their inherently inter-level character, mechanistic explanations are of a bottom-up nature. Nevertheless, they are not reductive. A mechanistic explanatory level is more than the sum of its parts, since the operational interrelations of the parts typically endow an upper level with properties and functions which go beyond the properties and functions characterizing parts at a lower level. Indeed, by their very nature, mechanisms are collections of entities and activities so organized that they do something that the components cannot do on their own. Moreover, not only are mechanistic explanations interlevel and non-reductive, but they may also be interdisciplinary or intertheoretic. That is, different explanatory levels of a mechanism may deploy the conceptual resources and vocabulary of different theoretical fields. Thus, the widely studied uh, long-term potentiation mechanism of synaptic uh, strengthening reaches upward to the phenomena of learning and memory studied by experimental psychologists, as well as downward into the molecular mechanisms that underlie the electrophysiological and chemical properties of neurons. Indeed, sometimes in order to integrate different explanatory levels of a mechanism, a new theoretical cum conceptual framework has to be developed, as is attested by the development of organic chemistry which was required in the 19th century in order to integrate chemistry with physiological or biological chemistry. It, will, it may well be the case that mechanistic explanations of mental capacities require such a theoretical cum conceptual breakthrough. Coming to speak of mechanistic explanations of mental capacities or of mental mechanisms, these have, according to Bechtel, two distinguishing features. 
First, they involve information processing. That is the manipulation of encoded information received, for example, from the environment. In upper levels of, con of cognition, the encoding is of a symbolic nature, where the connection between the symbol and its content is arbitrary. It is also the case that symbols at this level may be either discrete, as is assumed by classic cognitive science, or distributed and overlapping, as is assumed by connectionist models of cognition. Relatedly, the manipulation of the symbols, according to the classic model, is sequential and best captured by the mathematical notion of universal Turing machine, the key notion of, base of classic computation theory. In contrast, the manipulation of the symbols according to connectionist models is parallel and is captured by the mathematical notion of neural networks, the key notion of non-classic computation theory. Unlike the symbols at, the, at upper cognitive levels, the symbols at lower uh, neural levels are iconic, which means that the connection between the symbol and its content are much tighter than in higher cognitive levels. This raises the difficult question of how the symbols at these different levels are connected, which fortunately need not concern us here. The second distinguishing feature of mental mechanisms, according to Bechtel, is that they are active rather than merely responsive. This means, firstly, that the system they characterize are self-generating or self-producing. That is organized in such a way that the, the constituent processes produce components necessary for the continuance of those same processes. But it also means, secondly, that these systems actively control the flow of matter and energy <coughs> that keeps the system away from thermodynamic equilibrium. Such an active control requires that the system be oriented towards the environment seeking to maintain or actualize conditions that enable it to continue in its existence. But, and this is the third aspect of the activity of mental mechanisms, an orientation of this sort toward the environment is a normative attitude which endows the environment with meaning. It implicitly considers aspects of the environment as good or bad for the system. The second and third aspects mean that the system is adaptive, that is, selects courses of action appropriate for its normative goals. Adaptivity in this sense, however, is what cognition in a broad sense means. As biologist Umberto Maturana put it in a groundbreaking paper, a cognitive system is a system whose organization defines a domain of interactions in which it can act with relevance to the maintenance of itself. And the process of cognition is the actual acting or behaving in this domain. So activity uh, in the sense assumed here and cognition in the broad sense defined by Maturana they go in hand in hand together. Indeed, activity in this sense is the mark of living systems. So cognition in the broad sense and life go hand in hand together. Since cognition in the broad sense or acting with relevance to self-maintenance need not involve symbolic manipulation of information, as does cognition in the narrow sense outlined above, the question immediately arises of the connection between cognition in these two senses. Indeed, if a distinguishing feature of mental mechanisms is activity qua life, which goes hand in hand with cognition in a broad sense, why require, as Bechtel does, that mental mechanisms be characterized by cognition in the narrow sense? In other, in other, sense, in other words, there might be some tension between the two features symbolic information processing and activity, which Bechtel considers as the distinguishing marks of mental mechanisms. While these complicated issues did not concern us here, there is another relevant problem that Bechtel's association of mental mechanisms and activity, qua life, faces. Self-organizing, living systems may not be amenable to top-down decomposition, and thus require 
a different explanatory framework than the mechanistic one. It is to this framework, in the context of neocognitive science, that they now turn. While one aspect of the mechanistic account of cognition, its emphasis on symbolic processing of information, has been enjoying a vast consensus among neurocognitivists, it is this very aspect that has recently come under attack by philosophers such as uh, Tim Van Gelder, uh, neurocognitivists uh, such as Scott Kelso, developmental psychologists such as Esther Thelen, and roboticists such as uh, uh, Randy Byrne. Deploying the conceptual machinery of dynamical system theory, DST, that has been developed to deal with complex systems, these theories have been developing an alternative to symbolic processing models of cognition, which not only does not involve such processing, but as I will now show, may be amenable to a DN, descriptive analysis only, to a descriptive model of explanation only, not a mechanistic one. A complex system typically consists of components with similar features, for example, atoms or specific molecules, whose behavior is coupled in such a way that the system cannot be decomposed into working parts other than, the, other than these basic components. Moreover, the behavior of such systems cannot be explained bottom-up, since global features of the system as a whole causally affect the behavior of its component. That is, such systems may involve circular causality. And this is another reason why they cannot be decomposed top-down. Finally, such systems collect collectively self-organize themselves. In such systems, to summarize these three features, novel <coughs> uh, global or macro-level structures and processes emerge as a result of local interactions. And at the same time, these emerging global structures and processes constrain the local interactions. As an illustration of these features of complex systems, consider the classic example of the behavior of cooking oil in a frying pan. Applying heat to the pan increases the temperature difference between the cooler layer of oil at the top and the hotter layer of oil at the bottom. Where the temperature difference between top and bottom is small, there is no large scale or global motion of the oil. But eventually, when the difference becomes large enough, instability occurs and the liquid starts to roll in an orderly fashion no, known as convection rolls. In other words, the system undergoes a state transition as the new self-organizing behavior and spatial structures of convection rolls emerge. Moreover, at the same time of being created by interaction of the fluid molecules, the convection rolls govern or constrain the behavior of these molecules by drastically reducing the immense number of degrees of freedom of motion that the individual molecules would otherwise have. Since such systems cannot be decomposed top-down into a nested hierarchy of mechanisms within mechanisms, nor explained bottom-up, complex systems are not amenable to mechanistic explanations. Such systems can be dealt, however, by dynamical system theory, which I already mentioned, which provide the mathematical tools to give the state of the system under given parameters, for example, the amplitude of the convection rolls. At any point in time, given its actual or possible state at an earlier time, thus complex systems are amenable to the descriptive model, to the deductive and nomological model, and only to that model of explanation. While complexity modeling originated in physics, there are some good reasons for deploying it in neurocognitive science. One such reason, one such motivation, is the ecological or an active perspective in psychology, which takes the nervous system, the body and the environment, to be dynamically coupled or simultaneously changing and influencing each other in a continual cycle of adjustment. Viewing our cognitive system as a dynamic system, which comprises both the organism and the environment, 
And where each change in one element of the system continually influences every other element's direction of change, may suggest a dynamical system account of this system that does not involve symbolic processing of information. When specific features are coupled, it would be rather contrived to consider one as standing for symbolizing the other rather than the other way around. And thus, the whole idea of symbolic representation may be out of place. Moreover, once the organism and the environment are thought of as comprising just one system, it seems unnecessary to call on internal symbolic representations of environmental features when the features themselves are part of the system to be explained. Another major motivation for employing the tools of complexity modeling in neurocognitive science is work in robotics, cognitive ethology, developmental psychology, and perception, which shows how complex behavior may emerge from dynamical coupling of features that do not involve any symbolic processing of information. And there is a lot of work going on in this direction these days. It may also well be the case that the two marks of complex systems, emergence and circular causality, are crucially important in the context of neurodynamics. Neuroscience indicates that cognition, emotion, and action require the transient integration of numerous widely distributed and constantly interacting brain regions and areas. The dynamic patterns that such large-scale large integration involves emerge from distributed local neuronal activities. At the same time, it seems likely that these dynamic patterns constrain the local activities yielding them. Finally, large neural networks of the sort playing a role in connectionist models of cognition, which I mentioned before, that involve massive, massive continuous reciprocal causation may require a holistic explanatory stance which shifts away from modular mechanistic explanation towards systems dynamics. The research program seeking to explain all our cognition a la DN, a la, uh, in DST terms, that is in a descriptive way, in, in, in terms of dynamical system theory, is called radical embodied cognitive science. What are its prospects is a high controversial issue. As I argued elsewhere, some major aspects of our cognition, for example, our higher discursive capacities, require for the explanation the conceptual machinery of symbolic information processing, which renders indispensable mechanistic explanations that involve such a processing. But even if so, and as attested by the work in developmental psychology and perception mentioned above, at least some of our cognition can be explained in dynamical system uh, theory terms. Indeed, there may well be aspects of our cognition that can be explained only a la uh, the, the deductive nomological model in dynamical system theory terms. As I, as I reconstructed it, the dispute between the card and the scholastics is a dispute between two explanatory stances. On the one hand, mechanistic. On the other hand, descriptive. As I argued, contrary to what Descartes and other early moderns posited, if properly construed, the scholastic descriptive stance is just as genuine and legitimate an explanatory stance as the Cartesian mechanistic stance. Thus, the dispute between Descartes and the scholastics should be construed as a con controversy concerning the question of whether all explanations should be mechanistic, as Descartes might have thought, or rather at least some of them can be descriptive only. In order to answer this question, I turn to a contemporary dispute in neurocognitive science between proponents of a mechanistic approach and proponents of a dynamical system theory descriptive approach, a dispute which reflects the controversy between Descartes and the scholastics. As they claimed, while the mechanistic approach may be indeed indispensable for accounting for some central aspects of our cognition, there may well be other aspects for which the dynamical system uh, theory descriptive approach may be more appropriate, and perhaps even the only appropriate approach. 
In so far as this is the case, the scholastics have the upper end in their dispute with the card. Slightly paraphrasing what Leibniz said in one of his letters to Arnaud, Pacey Descartes, there may well be, indeed are, golden veins in the arid rocks of scholasticism. Thank you very much, Yakir. And, uh, well, um, the floor is open for questions. Yes, please, John. Thank you very much. Can you press the mic, please? Thank you very much for a fascinating paper. The only um, question I have really was about your conclusion about the scholastics getting the upper hand, because perhaps I misconstrued it, but I, I thought you illustrated very well how a lot of modern cognitive science falls into exactly the errors that Descartes attributed to scholasticism, namely reintroducing the phenomena we're supposed to be explaining. So that, for example, um, talk of mechanisms endowing the environment with meaning or having normative goals, as in the Bechtel stuff, would be exactly a case of that kind of circularity. Um, which, is sus which Descartes rightly, I think, said was suspect in the scholastics. And then even the, new, the dynamic system theory, um, as I understood it, but I'm rather ignorant about DST, but doesn't that involve a kind of concession of circularity, in a way? Yeah, so, uh, uh, as far as I understand, I mean, the... the the, the dynamical system uh, theory account is an account uh, in non-mechanistic terms which only describe the development or the dynamics of the uh, development of the system and uh, uh, can give you a, uh, a very accurate, accurate uh, uh, description uh, of the development of, of uh, different uh, the variables of the of the system that you consider as you consider as important or crucial or uh, the more interesting and to see how to see the developmental dynamics and uh, given given uh, given different initial conditions and uh, so I, I don't really see a security I mean it's a descriptive it's a, it's a descriptive way of uh, dealing with the with the system, and you can't, and it's the only way to deal with specific systems in which you can't, which you can't really decompose. For reasons that I, I mentioned in, in my talk, uh, and uh, as I try to, uh, I don't see circularity. Well, well, because if, if the features invoked in the theory are part of the system that was to be explained in the first place, yeah, but 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 uh, when. You, you might be assuming that in order to give a, a legitimate explanation requires uh, somehow uh, uh, explaining features of the, uh, or giving an account of features of the system in other terms, yeah. in different terms. Yeah. So in that respect, uh, uh, so, but, but there are systems that you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't give such an explanation. You can't really, you can't really uh, explain or give an account of features, of the features that interest you in other terms. Uh, so the only, the only thing you can do in these cases is uh, to describe how the system develops. And what they try to claim is, what they claim is that, uh, try to argue is that uh, uh, such a descriptive stance is, uh, can, can be considered as a legitimate explanatory stance. I mean, provided that the, that the generalization in terms of which you describe the system are counterfactually supporting, that is, they reflect, uh, they reflect genuine laws of nature, they're not mere generalizations, and uh, provided that, that that is the case, it's a legitimate uh, uh, concept of explanation. It's not a mechanistic one. It's a... Uh, but... I mean, if it's, uh, so it, it's not it's not circular, but 
but it doesn't give you the mechanism. It does. Yeah. Emily, please. One of the things that struck me as you were. Where is the mic? That struck me. Uh, it's up. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the button. Switch it. One of the things that struck me uh, as you were giving your um, exposition of the way in which the development in among philosophers of neuroscience has gone, is that uh, they were using the notion of a machine or a mechanism as a kind of central metaphor. So to go back to Descartes, Descartes takes the notion of a machine because the theory of simple machines is the part of ancient physics that was kind of mathematized. So he takes that over but then he really transforms what's con concerned, what's uh, considered as a machine. You know, he's surrounded by all kinds of machines around, you know, 1650 that are rather novel inventions, and he invokes all of them, and he says, ah, they're machines, they must have a... But in fact, the mathematical theory of those machines isn't really going to be developed for another hundred years, but it's a helpful metaphor. So. Uh, I also had in mind um, uh, Jean Starobinsky's wonderful book on reaction, the term reaction, and, and it's how it uh, gets used first by chemistry and then by uh, physiology because it has a kind of scientific cachet. So I have the, I have the same feeling about the mechanism. When you look at mechanisms in biology, um, they really operate in a completely different way, or, no, or a very different way than mechanisms in physics, and they aren't really as predictable <laughs> as they are in physics. You know, like, look at the, the, um, the feedback system of a cell and an enzyme going in around in a cell. Well, that's the kind of system you were talking about, but you can't really tell where the enzyme's gonna go next, right? Uh, well, two points. First of all, uh, I agree that the, the, the notion of uh, mechanism uh, is a complicated notion it, uh, and uh, that uh, it went uh, through some evolution and, uh, uh, and uh, but, but, uh, uh, but and, and there are different sorts of mechanisms and uh, and biological mechanisms are not like clocks, and uh, but but still, you know, uh, people like Bechtel or Craver or uh, other people who are trying to um, to reframe the mechanistic uh, explanatory framework, uh, they are trying to abstract from all the di to, to abstract from the from the differences and give a a. a an abstract account of mo what the mechanistic explanation means, and then it's it's a it's a sort of a generic uh, a generic uh, model, and uh, which which can suit or can be applied to different fields. Now they are mainly doing it for uh, biology and uh, mainly for uh, neurocognitive science, uh, and, uh, and and which brings me to a second point. Uh, uh, one criticism of, of uh, their approach to uh, uh, biological mechanisms is that uh, is exactly the point that you made, that uh, uh, you can't really decompose because the, for instance, in biological systems, uh, there are uh, downward causation, there are circular, there is circular causality, the causation there is circular causality. Right. So uh, for that for that very reason, uh, biological so-called biological mechanisms are not decomposable. 
And, and since they are not decomposable, you can't really treat them as mechanisms. Allah, the model of, uh, of uh, Bechdel, and, uh, and okay, so in the, if they're not decomposable, so what, what can we do? So in that case, uh, maybe, I mean, there are people who think that way, uh, uh, biological mechanisms should be accounted for in terms of dynamical system theory yes. because you can't decompose them. So all you can do is only do what the scholastic thought you can do. You can so, describe but, but part of my point there would be um, you can go a certain way to modeling them with a different kind of mathematics, but you can't really predict exactly what's going to happen next. And so the DN model with its requirement of prediction yeah. doesn't really apply. Well, it, well if, if, the if, if the system is, uh, becomes very complex and chaotic, so you can't really, I mean, the mathematics, it, it goes beyond your... Uh, but it's not even the, compl it's, see, it's not even the, the chaotic notion of complexity here. It is, you have a little thing floating around in a cell. You can't tell what it's going to do next. That's different. That's a different point. Well, uh, well, some uh, uh, some phenomena, you know, might be uh, might reach, might outreach our uh, capacities. I mean, to yeah. even <laughs> even the, no, even the like us. <laughs> yeah, even the uh, uh, well, dynamical system theory has its limits, but still. Uh, it is it, it is it is a, a very uh, forceful theory. I mean, you can do a lot with it. So is physics. <laughs> so is physics. You you can do a lot with it, and you can explain. For instance, there are all kinds of uh, accounts of uh, uh, cognitive phenomena, very complicated. For instance, uh, the way uh, uh, the Porsche there is a, a spider, a jumping spider. Uh, which exhibits a, a, an extremely uh, complex behavior. And he has a, a, a brain which is uh, like a needle, like the, the pin of the needle. It's very small, very tiny. So it's, it, it's really puzzled the uh, cognitive ethologist. How, how, how can he do it I mean, with such a small brain? And you can explain it in terms of uh, dynamical system theory without any, uh, you don't need any uh, information processing and anything. And you can give a very uh, interesting and nice uh, uh, mathematical account of, of its behavior, of the behavior of this creature. And you can do it for uh, aspects of our behavior as well. For, for instance, Esther Tellen, whose picture I showed her, uh, she did a, a very interesting work on, on, uh, in developmental psychology on the behavior of, uh, of infants, on, on small kids. Uh, and she can explain things that Otherwise, we, we couldn't really explain. In terms of dynamical system theory, with the mathematics of the, uh, of the system and uh, of the, that theory, and uh, so you can do a lot with it. I mean, it's that... Uh, you, you can do a lot with physics, too. <laughs> That's true. Yes, please. Uh, well, thank you. Let me ask this. Your distinction between mechanistic explanation and explanations that are merely descriptive, as in dynamic system theory, rests on the notion of a counterfactual supporting generalization. Now, some would say this is to explain the obscure by the obscurer uh, as much as uh, substantial forms are. Uh, because uh, we need uh, we need an account on how counterfactual conditionals uh, are to be uh, accepted as true or true or false, uh, and I you know it's not an account that uh, 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 that we are sh we are certain we have, but even even aside from this. Surely, if you invoke counterfactual conditionals or non-accidental generalization, then you have more than a description there. It's not just you know. It's not just a description. It's there is there is a certain notion of of law, yeah, of law like law likeness uh, that's uh, that's invoked in your term uh, description, uh, which. Uh, um, which uh, 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 needs an needs an account, and in particular, it needs an account 
to distinguish it from mechanistic explanations, uh, which are uh, which can also be uh, subsumed uh, under the DN uh, um, uh, model. Also, the positivists have believed yeah. that that uh, 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 explanation by causes are to be subsumed under the, the DN. So the distinction remains not entirely clear. Okay. As to the uh, account of the counterfactuals, I'm assuming here, you know, the standard account, there is a, the standard account of Lewis Estonica, which is uh, highly developed. I mean, it might be controversial, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a highly developed account. Yeah, well, and I very sophisticated, I and, uh, and uh, actually, I think uh, that Lewis himself, I mean, is, is really, part of his motivation was to give an account of uh, covering laws, laws of nature, and uh, he has a very uh, sophisticated account. Uh, now, uh, as, to, as to your second point, uh, whether the, the distinction between uh, mechanistic explanations and uh, descriptive explanations is vague, to, to some extent I, I agree because when you, when, you, when, you, when you bottom out, I mean when you get to the uh, lower levels of uh, mechanistic explanations, all you have there are actually descriptions. I mean you don't have anything more than description. The question is where, uh, uh, how, uh, where, where you begin and when you start. I mean, if, if the descriptions, uh, if you can decompose the system until you reach a, a basic level where all you can do is actually describe. Uh, so th that's, one sort, that's one sort of case. And the other case is that, that you, you can't really decompose. The explanation is, is, is at, the, at, the, at the top levels. You can't really go but uh, top down. You can't really decompose the, the, the system. And, and so the difference is not, I, I, I agree that there is, some, there is a, a penumbra of vagueness, and, uh, which, is, uh, which might be very wide. And uh, that you can't, uh, you can't really, uh, there isn't really a very strict uh, distinction between the two, the two conceptions of explanations, but there, there still is a, a, a difference between a system that you can decompose until you reach a level where you can't really do anything more rather than describe, and a system which you, you stay on the surface of the system and you can't really do anything more rather than explain, rather than describe the features that characterize that, uh, that system. And that's a difference. This is a difference that makes a difference. I don't think that, now, right. now right. In, in another right. point. Scholastic. Pardon? Neither systems obey what you uh, 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 gave to scholasticism. That's the point. No, I, I, I think, well, because they're, they're empirical. <laughs> Nothing in scholastic was empirical. Well, I disagree. But the. The kill, we have to finish. So. Okay. No, go. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, 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 I want to say something more about, about the, the, the mechanistic, I think that the mechanistic worldview was to find some, uh, the, they aspired to find some uh, a, a restricted set of, uh, of uh, features or uh, uh, activities in the world in terms of which you can explain all natural phenomena. Uh, so, in a sense, I mean, you reach a bot rock, a, a, a rock bottom, which can't really be decomposed, and which you, you have to you have to accept as a primitive or, a, and at that level, you can only explain. That's part. That's part of the. That's part of the. Game. Describe. Describe. Yeah. That, that's part of the. That's part of this worldview. I mean, you reach a, a rock bottom. And that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.